your future. Greetings, fellow travelers. It is I, Dankard Lexicon. Before we start today's episode, first a quick announcement. We are preparing a Kickstarter for our new comic series, Journey to Elysium. Please give our Kickstarter a follow and spread the word. Recently, we did a poll on the YouTube channel on what aspect of our steampunk series we should discuss next, and you requested a history that inspired the setting of the Association of Ishtar. Your second pick was to talk about the characters, and it so happened that we already had been working on such an article, so here we are. In today's study, we'll look into Inspector David Alborough and what makes him a steampunk character, despite him not wearing a top hat. I'll do so without any spoilers for the range in the machine. We'll discuss his character type and what makes him the man he is. This includes a history of policing of the 19th century, so welcome to this double feature. In previous videos I discussed genre tropes, but those characters were more generic sci-fi archetypes common in stories. For this essay I'll step away from steampunk's pulp and sci-fi heritage. What I'm looking for is what makes steampunk unique and unlike other genres that preceded it. If steampunk is as unique as we believe it is, then it should have its own archetypes. I also feel the need to emphasize that steampunk is a a subgenre and b a niche. And what I mean is, writing steampunk is an activity with a very specific tool set. What makes steampunk such a challenging genre to write for is that it's high concept based. For those unfamiliar, high concept is often summarized as a what if story, but more concretely it means it's about characters in specific situations. To write high concept you need a solid question and a vision that you want to explore. In past videos on characters in sci-fi I mentioned the hacker, the enforcer and the outsider and what their role is within the setting. The enforcer supports the prevailing system actively or passively, the outsider is new or locked outside of the prevailing system and finally the hacker who subverts or uses the system in ways it was not intended. What makes High Concept interesting is it's not about good and evil, it's an exploration, you are taking the reader on a journey. It's almost like a documentary in a way, best visualized in movies like What We Do in the Shadows, westerns like Deadwood and 1883. The same goes for our latest book, Bound for the Sticks. Yes, there are characters that develop and grow, but those are dictated by the setting rather than the other way around. That means that these stories don't need an antagonist or even a good ending. Blade Runner, for instance, has characters with an antagonistic relationship, but why their enemies is not because one is good and the other evil. Decker, played by Harrison Ford, is the enforcer, hunting a group of rogue androids called replicants. Outsiders. But replicants aren't evil, they just want to survive. If that means killing humans, so be it. Decker in this regard is just a bureaucrat enforcing the law. What makes Decker interesting is not because he's a hero, it's how this hunt for the replicants changes him and making him question his own humanity. What makes the characters interesting is their reaction to circumstance. After all, what changes most people's lives aren't traumatic events like in the movies, it's other little things that makes people reevaluate their lives. One person I know started dedicating his life to martial arts because he once got yelled at at a gas station. You'll likely have heard such stories or experienced insignificant events that make you decide you needed a change. That leads to the question, what is a steampunk character struggle? Hereby I present to you the skeptic, the weird engineer and the technocrat. Their archetypes draw their origins from science fiction, noir, western and history itself. For that we need to make an analysis of what the 19th century represents that goes beyond the stereotypes of the Dickens novels from which the majority of people draw their information on this era. 
Now this will be very generalizing, but over the course of these blogs and videos, I will delve into these archetypes, starting with the main character of The Wrench in the Machine, Inspector David Albaro. By 1875, in which the novel is set, Albaro is an inspector in the Dover Police Department, whose attitude to policing was mainly informed by the pioneering days of policing. Alboro's father was one of the first constables in England after the secretary Sir Robert Peel introduced several bills, like the Peace Preservation Act of 1814 and the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829. The most ambitious of these was the Municipal Corporations Act that was passed by Parliament in 1835, which was required the creation of 178 royal boroughs across the country. This was the birth of the so-called Peelers members of a paid police force walking their beats full time. Among these was the Dover Police Bureau, which was joined by Alboro's father soon after its creation. These early peelers can be recognized by their slim police uniforms and top hats. Their primary duty wasn't as defined as upholding the law, but preserving the peace and therefore remedying any situation that might cause a disturbance. When walking their beat, Peelers didn't just catch criminals, but they would perform sanitary duties like street sweeping, unclogging drains and firefighting. What made them different from other police forces at the time was that this force policed with consent. This was defined in Robert Peel 9 Principles of Policing. To summarize, the police were civilians maintaining order for the sake of the citizenry, not the state. Therefore, police doctrine needed the approval of said citizens. I need to stress that the police were created in line with the prevailing liberal principles of the time. They were members of the public, unlike the military gendarmerie on the continent. Their goal was to maintain law and order in collaboration with the citizens, not to enforce the will of the state. There was also a distinction between private and public spaces. This was a contentious issue, as a person's home was an area where the government wasn't allowed to intervene. A sound concept, but an issue when considering domestic abuse and other crimes committed outside the public domain. Before long, the police would start raiding the first homes to conduct arrests. Another contentious issue was the right to bear firearms. The first peelers carried a rattle, a truncheon and a top hat for protection. Later, this was upgraded by a helmet. It wasn't until 1884 when two constables, David Garner and William Schnell, were shot on the 18th of July 1884 by two burglars in Huxton. Without firearms, the officers had no choice to chase the armed suspect, armed with nothing but clubs and jammies. Yes, they overpowered him with crowbars on the rooftops of London. After this incident, constables were asked if they wanted to carry arms. Still, most constables refused. Guess they really liked their crowbars. Although cops going all Gordon Freeman on criminals sounds awesome, it was just another example how liberal idealism clashed with the realities of policing. In the 1830s, the constables' many responsibilities were being delegated to other dedicated institutions. In 1824, Edinburgh formed the world's first fire department, and English cities soon followed suit. Their sanitary duties would also be a thing of the past. In Alborough's timeline, Dover would establish its fire department in the wake of a fire in the Black Horse Tavern on the 13th of September, 1857. This was a pivotal moment in Alboro's life, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. David Alboro was born in 1828 in the port city of Dover, England. Despite his father being a constable, little David was anything but Bobby material. His mother died at a young age and his father remarried with Teresa Oldhook, who had three sons of her own. It was, however, his oldest brother, Harold, who kept the three other boys in line as their father was off walking his beat. But David didn't feel he belonged in this family. Feeling like an outsider in his own household, he spent most of his time on the streets by himself, causing all manner of mischief that swiftly developed into a reputation for being a hoodlum. 
Being the black sheep of the family, he often had arguments with his father, leading to even more resentment in the boy. After just one such row, his father was shot while walking his beat. David was 14 when his father died. Without an opportunity to make amends to the things he had done and said, David Alboro felt increasingly guilty for being a disappointment. This is likely what drove him to become a constable, a profession to gain his father's approval from the hereafter. However, it wasn't enough to establish a meaningful bond with his foster mother, and once all her sons had grown up, she left the Alboro home to live by herself at the dime of her more prosperous sons, each of whom managed to find her own path through life. And so, David was by himself in the home his father left him, estranged from his family. Professionally, David was far from the ideal constable, using more illicit means of apprehending culprits. He gained a reputation for chasing suspects with a vengeance and beating the snot out of them. However, there were only that many problems acts of random violence can resolve, and the fact his father's murderer was never found weighed heavily on his mind. A little known story is that Alboro did discover the man who shot his father. After years of searching, he discovered his identity and traced him back to a town. Finding him was a simple matter as he had stayed in the same place for a number of years, that being an unmarked mouse grave at the town's boundaries containing the unclaimed victims of a cholera epidemic. It turned out Alboro had been the only one who had cared about the fate of this man. It made him conclude it was likely better to be hated than be forgotten. Alboro grew even more isolated, realizing it had nothing meaningful to offer. Sure, he dealt with criminals, but he was despised for it. But maybe he could be remembered by the people who hated him. Those who got caught after committing a crime. And perhaps that wasn't such a bad thing. During the summer of 1857, Dover was in the grip of arson attacks that were set with sophisticated firebombs. These attacks were aimed at establishments with connections to the royal garrison quartered at Dover Castle. At first they attacked warehouses and a recruitment center, but after security had been ramped up, they went after softer targets and set fire to civilian stores that catered to soldiers and mariners. One of these establishments was the Black Horse Tavern, which got set on fire on the night of the 17th of September. The citizens were already hard at work containing the fire when Arboro and his colleague James Christopher were the first constables to arrive at the scene. Alboro faced the inferno and forced himself through the broken beams. After getting burned himself, he managed to liberate the victim from the burning building. When the constable emerged from the flames, the crowd received him as a hero. It was one of the strangest moments of his life, as he never felt welcomed anywhere. The moment of triumph, however, was short-lived as the victim died en route to the hospital. The newspaper celebrated the actions of the lone constable running into the flames to save the damsel from the vile actions of a terrorist. In the end, her name was but an obituary while his actions were making headlines that week. But the death of this total stranger struck him deeply. For once, he had done the right thing. And it wasn't good enough. But then a breakthrough. The police department was tipped off about the identity of the suspect, a certain William MacArthur, a young man from a well-to-do household with a chemistry degree who fell in with the communards. At the informant or the police of his next target, Arboro chased the suspect with vengeance on his mind. Before long, he had caught the terrorist, and by the time his colleague James Christopher caught up with him, Arboro had already beaten the suspect to an inch of his life. After being brought to the hospital, MacArthur was officially arrested. Unfortunately, the court case was less clear-cut than first assumed. MacArthur used his considerable connections to countersue for police brutality, and was close to developing into a scandal and an embarrassment to the police department. 
However, when James Christopher took the stand to testify, he confessed to being the one who crippled MacArthur without informing Alboro of his intentions. David never understood what Christopher was thinking. He even attempted to talk Christopher out of this lunacy, but when he visited his colleague, it turned out Christopher was dying of lung cancer. Before his death, Christopher was discharged and the case would be buried to avoid further embarrassment. MacArthur was convicted to 30 years in prison for attempted terrorism and associating with the Communards. Alboro did get promoted for his bravery, service and productive attitude. He had become such a celebrity, he was even offered a senior function in a new fire department. Yet, he refused. Alboro felt like he was on borrowed time. Horses beyond his control had rolled out a red carpet for him to get where he was. One wrong move, and that rug would be pulled from underneath his feet. For all intents and purposes, Alboro felt he had gotten a second chance thanks to Christopher's sacrifice. For 15 years, he would perform his new function, tracking down murderers, gangsters, and other criminals. He also proposed reforms like having inspectors be in civilian closing so they would look less intimidating. And that brings us to Inspector Alboro in the present. Aged 48, he was an officer in his twilight years. He didn't grow up with wavecasters, popular music, audio dramas or electric cars. Even electricity he considered a luxury until he got the opportunity to connect his old home to the power grid. He observed the growing population, state intervention and technology's influence on public life with suspicion. The more things changed, the more he desired them to stay the same, as it felt that the world was leaving him behind as the old was being paved over by the new. At this stage in his career, he was expected to pass over the truncheon to a new generation of inspectors who were more knowledgeable about the present. The first archetype in the series, the skeptic is a character who is adverse to change. He tends to be an older individual who grew up in a different world than the one he's currently in. He's like a pioneer in the American West, except that he never left civilization to look for greener pastures. They are far more risk averse and yet don't feel at home in modern society either. Instead, the skeptic might be very set in his ways, rarely moving house in an unconscious attempt to stick to familiarity even when that home is crumbling around him. Instead of noticing the decay in his own life, he's more focused on the wider world where machines are replacing animals and men. Not to mention the shift in social structures and mobility. Once peaceful, parts of the city are turning into ghettos with all the problems that they bring. The skeptic blames progress brought on by the rise of industry, advances in technology and associated social ills. This might also make him adverse to the state, be it due to its unwillingness to solve social problems because it doesn't advance the ambitions of said state, or because the elite are more interested in shaping the lower classes into what they want them to be, rather than solving the roots of their problems by blaming it on abstract concepts like capitalism or godlessness. The skeptic is unlikely to be a fan of the counter-movement either, especially revolutionary ones, seeing in them the same power-mongering and technocratic ambitions as that of the current ruling class. Like the pioneers, the skeptic is self-reliant, focusing on the situations that he can change, be it on his own well-being, his family and friends, or the local community and hates it whenever the government agents or revolutionary come by to remind them of the bigger picture or tell them what to do or what rules to live by. The skeptic rebels in his own way, even if it's an uphill battle. Progress is a flood during which you can sink or swim, an unstoppable force brought on by knowledge and human nature. Humanity ate from the apple tree, and now it must suffer 
the consequences. Alboro's skepticism is informed by his age, experience, and police policy. Having walked the streets of Dover for as long as he has, he witnessed how modernity changed his community for better or for worse. He has seen people squander their youths, addicts ruin their families, and the wicked destroy people's lives. By nature, he is a slow adopter of new technology and cares little for appearances. He witnessed the attempts by the established elite and social engineers to force change. Due to his age and disillusion with policy, progress is something of a dirty word, and he tolerates novelty on a good day. But what draws readers to his characters is his persistence and desire to live up to his own moral standard. Despite not being proud of the title, he never ceased. He never ceased being a bloodhound. It's that persistence that makes him heroic, despite himself. However, that stubbornness also applies to his skepticism. When confronted with his own limitations, he is reluctant to seek help or adopt helpful technologies. It leads him to question if there is a point in rejecting technological innovations in a world that will move on without him. And with that, we'll end today's lesson. If you're curious to know what happens next to Alboro, his story continues in the ranch, in the machine, the first novel set in the association of Ishtar universe. You can buy it on our own web store, or you can support us on Ream Stories, a new subscription platform for both readers and writers alike. You can read all our short stories there for free, or become a member and get access to all our ebooks. New short stories are published every week. I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope it wasn't too rambly, the next one will be more to the point. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna bid you adieu, and as always, make things your way.